The following presentation was recorded at the 2012 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond Sponsors in 2012 for helping make these videos possible. Part time, uh, at night time, I, I teach Linux, uh, Systems Administration and the Fundamentals of Linux. <clears throat> Open source is something that I am an advocate of. So one of the things that I decided to do today is to get more, it's, it's kind of what I might say a different approach today to teaching, or not even teaching, it's not a technical session, but more of a, an, an educational session as to why we need to promote open source. And open source, as we all know, that many of us know is not as present or available to the masses. It's available to the masses, but Microsoft seems to do a great push in pushing uh, their product. Here, we go by word of mouth. But I can tell you one of the things that when I say word of mouth, <clears throat> is we have a very strong community. It's a very strong open source community and something that I believe that we should push very, um, not only openly, but uh, with force. One of the things that i uh, talking to you about today in education, with open source, teaching kids from the ages of grade school all the way to college. I teach the college level right now, but I'm working my way into the junior high schools. Teaching uh, Linux, for instance, is something where any child can learn. And these are one of the things that I'm trying to promote to many adults that have access to uh, young adults or even children. Why am I saying that? Is because it opens so many different doors. Let me give an example. Uh, Pandora's box has been open now that more and more people understand, for instance, cyber terrorism. And these are one of the things that people don't realize that if we don't get involved with computers more and more as far as young children are concerned or young adults, we're gonna be losing behind the curve even further. Now when I say that, let me, let me try to back up a little bit and be clear. One of the things that we lack, okay, is technology as far as in the United States of keeping up with other countries. Uh, they're, they're the BRIC countries, Brazil, India, China, Russia, those countries right now are pretty far advanced. Whether people want to recognize it or not or realize it or not, they're very far advanced. Here, on the other hand, you hear the quote unquote, and I'm being honest with you, you hear lip service. And the lip service that you hear all the time is education, education, education. But nothing is happening that is really making that difference. Now, one of the things that I would say in pushing it is science and math. In science and math, in, in the world, we are 17th in the world. There's really no excuse for that. However, if you go to the people in the legislature, they'll tell you over and over, we're, oh, we're doing what we can, we're doing it. No, that's not enough, okay? Everyone that's in this room that works at open source has talents, has a ton of talent. And what I'm trying to do is to organize more and more with different people to organize those talents. Why? Is because, in all honesty, open source can really, in any country, not just this one alone, can actually revolutionize education. And how can it do so? It's by just taking a simple example. Learning about the kernel or just development, if you give kids the opportunity to work, and I'm just saying kids, and when I say kids, uh, I'm older than you think, uh, young adults, even if they're 20 years old, you can give them the opportunity to expand their horizons and not pigeonhole them in one area. In other words, open source or Linux, for instance, is not just programming. It's not just development, okay? There, there are many different aspects of it. So thus, when you expose a child to uh, open source, you'll see how many different avenues of possibilities that they can choose from. It's not so much where the classical education today is somewhat inadequate. A lot of teachers or instructors are far removed from understanding what computers are about, let alone open source. 
Now, understand where I'm coming from here is, like I said, this is a different approach. A lot of kids today are diagnosed, for instance, with ADD or ADHD, attention deficit disorder. But in all honesty, let's take a look and take a look at open source. If we did, and I don't have enough pictures to really show you today because this is kind of acting a little bit funny, I see, so I'm going to try to give you a visual imagination. If you notice a lot of kids today, they are great, not just great, excellent at video games. Excellent at video games. To the point that I, I, can, I can bet just by anybody in this room, I bet you there's some kids that are younger than us that can give us a run for our money. Now, if you notice, this is a different generation that we're dealing with. When I say we're dealing with as a group as a whole, if you put a newspaper in front of them or a book, they can't comprehend it. Why? Because it's static. So what it is, is if you ever look at the eyes of an, a young individual, their eyes are constantly moving. What a video game is constantly moving. So their eyes follow. And if you notice, they learn the levels and the steps of each level inside that game. It goes higher and higher and higher. I can't get past the first level. But they can go all the way up to the top, and you know what? They get bored. They have, that's why they come out with another game. But if we put a book in front of them, they get stuck. Now, the question is, okay, well, what do we do about that? Well, we need to expose them to open source because it's constantly, in all honesty, moving parts. And they can make it move. You put it in front of them, they can fix it. You can put a PlayStation in front of them and they can program it. So therefore, yes, we have the ability to let them make changes. However, each individual in here has the ability to help to instruct them and give them the direction. So that's where we don't go wrong as a group. We can instruct them, okay? We can teach them the fundamentals, okay? We can teach them the fundamentals. Why? It's not just, I mentioned that science and math are good. Science and math, in all honesty, is in just about anything and everything that we do. So thus, if you notice, a lot of times that schools push away kids from science and math and say, well, you can learn this, you can, hey, I'm not taking anything away from other subjects. But I would definitely say, for instance, if you're pushing a kid towards basket weaving, that's not going to work. Science and math you need to be strong in. And computers, it deals with nothing more than science and math. One of the things I also realize is if you get a higher certification or the higher that you go in certification, it doesn't have to be open source. You can be in, uh, you can deal with Cisco networks. You can go all the way to the top. But in all honesty, those that really do well are really good at math and science. Okay, if you want to be an architect in computers, you have to have math and science as your background. So what do we have to do? We have to cultivate the culture, the culture that we have. So at the same time, you also want to realize that young students do have the opportunity to what? Go to different sites. Now, I only put some of these sites up here on the board. Like I said, the computer here and trying to turn back around, it's, it would just take too much time. These are educational softwares, but a lot of education today, if you notice, they talk about, well, our, education, our educational software runs on Linux. We're not interested in running on Linux. We're interested in teaching them open source or Linux. We're interested in teaching them, show them how it works. Because if you can show them how it works, there is, I'll give you an example. The government, for instance, and I'm not just talking about jobs alone. The government, for instance, is looking for what? Cyber soldiers. Okay, the, the cold term that you hear in the media, it says when they're involved in a conflict, they'll say, well, you know what, we, we, we'll get involved, but no boots on the ground. Well, no boots on the ground, what does that mean? That's cyber warfare. That's what it is. Cyber warfare and or drones. So what it is, they're looking for talent. They can't find enough talent to help them forward their mission. And they have unstoppable and ungodly amounts of money to spend to make sure things can go in the interest of, for instance, the United States. It could be any country. It could be China, any country. But in this country, so in other words, let me, let me give you an example. It's like taking a scenario several years ago when 
The Pentagon, as everybody knows how hard it is to break into the Pentagon. It would just, you would be shot before you get over the first gate, okay? However, to get through the front door and get through the turnstiles, you need all kind of clearances. But not for one man that was there back, and I would say it was somewhere around the time around 2007, when he went into the parking lot, okay, of the Department of Defense. And inside the Department of Defense, He had about maybe 50 or 60 flash drives. And what did he do? He just threw them all over the parking lot. Just threw them all over the parking lot. And he left. And what happened when people came back from lunch? Oh, look what I found here. And what happened? They walked right through security, right through the front gate inside of the Pentagon and, and, and just, just with no problem. And what, did they, what are they normally, uh, a curious person is going to do when they have something in their hand, they have nothing to do? A board employee, stick it right into the machine. Well, then everything broke loose. All chaos broke loose. And they couldn't find where the damage was coming from because it was coming from different locations within inside the organization. Now, after they finally found that, they shut down all the systems and they had to have removed these drives. And if you go into a lot of government institutions, you go into a lot of financial institutions, you're not even allowed to use flash drives anymore. It's not even, not even allowed. Well, think about it. We've changed. So if we've changed as far as what technology has brought us, we need to be able to keep up with it. And open source is the greatest way to catch, catch the wind. We don't have to constantly pay a quote unquote Microsoft to try to keep up because every time we try to do something, they charge us money. I'm not gonna hesitate and hold back and say that that's what they do. Every time we turn around, they wanna charge us money. Open source, we share. And since we share, now is the time to take advantage of that sharing. It's too much, it's to, and I go back to that, that cyber attack that was used with the flash drives. Think about today. It's too hard and it's too much trouble for me to jump over the fence. Why take the risk? It's too much effort. When I can brute force hack into your machine or your machine and not think twice about it and take all your information. And that was the thing that if you, we, we might touch on that later on with Stuxnet, okay, and the flame virus. Okay, these are things that the government says, listen, we need to protect ourselves. Why? Because in the past, for many of you that don't know, if for instance, for those of you that remember when the, when the Northeast and the Southeast, they had an, a, a, an electrical power outage, all the way from the North, from Canada, all the way down to Florida. And what was the excuse that they used? The excuse that they used was, oh, well, we have an old power grid. Oh, really? But did they ever fix the power grid? No, oh, we just got it working again. No. Okay, that is what Stuxnet is. It deals with industrial type viruses. It goes right inside your system and look for industrial plants and it can shut down your entire infrastructure. So instead of having boots on the ground, why drop a bomb on a country and you can kill maybe 100,000 when you can use a cyber attack or a worm and get into someone else's or a country's system, and you can disable their entire water infrastructure, their electrical grid, their nuclear power grid. That's how powerful it is. So with the power of teaching open source, there are many avenues of approach to bring not only students up, but this country up as well. And this is the thing that I'm trying to get people to understand is, we can totally revolutionize the way that we do education, the way that we do, do learning in general, and the way we do things, period. Because we don't need to be charged a whole bunch of money. We have many different communities that are out there that in fact, um, that give you free education. And like I said, I didn't want to turn around uh, with my back to you, and so I, what I'll do is just, I'll just continue because otherwise I have to keep playing with, but, there are a lot of students out there today that don't realize, when I say students or, or people that are interested in learning about open source, don't realize how many jobs are really out there. Now, I'm sure everyone here has heard the news many times over. Oh, the unemployment rate is high. Oh, there are not enough jobs out there. Everyone here in open source knows there are plenty of jobs in open source. Edu uh, not education, but jobs. Linux administrators, system administrators, web developers, system programmers, okay, Linux, Unix, 
is there. And then at the same time, we don't take advantage of it. Why? Because many people don't know about it. So we're trying to gather as many different organizations, and you have some that are getting on board. IBM is getting on board or has gotten on board. Um, there are a number of different companies that have gotten on board to actually promote it. But it's going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a lot of effort. One of the things that I would say also about this is you have the opportunity to use computers that are very old. A lot of people say, well, I don't have a computer. You can use the oldest of computers and run open source on it. It doesn't matter. I mean, I'm not saying something that's 15 years old. I mean, being realistic, but if your system is five years old, you can still keep it running. It's beautiful. Open source is something really, really, really wonderful. Now, to have something like a, for instance, I'll give you an example. This is not the, this is not computers, but it's something, let me see here. This is something similar that you'll probably all have heard of before. And like I said, even it's, it's slow, even though I, uh, it's, uh, I just use Khan Academy as an example. If you notice in Khan Academy, they give you what? They give you free education for what? For different, of course, like I said, for math, science, is on this one website. And when, when it finally uh, looks to cooperate, you'll be able to see where it gives you free calculus, it gives you free um, all this kind of stuff here. Sending requests. It's a little slow here. Yeah. Well, it's just my luck. But anyway, so it's, 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 it's free education that they give you, and you're able to go there, and you can learn science, and you can learn math. The same thing that we can do for what? Open source, for computers. Okay, it's just slow today, so we can't seem to get it. But with computers, if we teach it and teach it as it's free, yes, you can make money. There, there are other ways you can make money, but promote it. Okay, promote it. And before I continue, any questions before I continue? Okay, no questions. All right, fine. So, oh, there we go. If you notice here, for instance, you have algebra, algebra solving equations. And this is all free. These give 10 minute videos of each. Okay? Algebra graphics. And this keeps on going. This is a one person has done this. Okay? This is all algebra. Let me scroll down some more. Just now you have arithmetic. Okay. And you have, in this case, he likes art history, but um, he has uh, calculus, and all of that is free. So what we need to do is to do the same thing. So that's the project that right now I'm working on in order to create a portal for web videos, not a YouTube type portal, but a portal that's organized where we can make that education free. Okay, where you can go up there and you can learn about, in this case I only use calculus for math skills, but I think you get the concept of what I'm trying to bring across. You can do it for Programming, if you're learning MySQL, put it up there and we can categorize it. Once we categorize it, okay, then anybody and everybody can go up there and see it for free. Okay, and it doesn't matter what the topic is. And after a while, it will grow. So this way, it doesn't really cost us much money to what? Promote this avenue of, or promote this avenue of learning. Okay, I only use this because I don't have over 3,000, but he has over 200 million hits, or downloads, I should say, 200 million. I can't do all that. He did this over a number of, of six years, seven years, 3,000 videos. But if we all get together, and that's what I'm trying to do is create a portal where we can all do it, and it's free. Now, we're on top of it where we can actually teach each and every person that's in here and other people to move forward. So going further, and everybody can see that, that, that I know the, it might be a little, um, it might be a little, let me sh show you, uh, go down. Now, one of the things that I, I also want you to be aware of, 
and you, you might not understand this. Let me go to the things that you need to be careful of. Because one of the things that people can learn in, in open source is the do's and the don'ts. And I'll take you to one test. It's to take our education or our knowledge for what we know, okay, and learn how to reverse engineer what we find. Now, let me see. Well, anyway, I'm going to show you. Test engine, I'll give you an example. What we need to do with open source is to teach people about malware, scareware, okay, um, and adware. That's a whole other approach for learning. And teaching them and why it's important. So an example, and there are many different websites, and I'll show you one that deals with, uh, it's one called Test Engine. How to actually break down a site and find out whether or not it actually can harm your computer or harm you in general. I'll give you an example. There's a site up there that's still up there now. It's called Test Engine. I was up there trying to get certification, you know, for the students. And what I tried to do is, is to pay for it. I paid for it and it downloaded a terrible virus on my system. It just ran right, and it took over $100 out of my account. The thing is, they're still out there. But if we teach these, these, the younger generation today how to actually program, instead of making them black hat, we can make them what they call white hat, okay? We can actually create our own, what they call cyber armies, in order to um, defend against this. Cyber terrorism, I use this as a, a key example time and time again. Why? It's because it's not totally new, but it's ever-increasing. It's ever-increasing technology. So now we're on the verge of a technological edge. So how do we get to the forefront of it? Is by what? Making ourselves cyber soldiers. Okay, so if you have any ideas or anything that you would like to contribute, that's what we look for. Okay, and that's what we're creating. And that's what we're looking to talk about. And we'll be um, coordinating with a number of different uh, corporations and they're looking to, forward to it, but what I'm looking for more are individuals. Because you would, it's not about having people even try to throw money at the situation, it's to have people learn. Okay, and that's, uh, that's the, the premise of it. Questions? We, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. No, um... That's what I was going to say, they do that they haven't set up to have Okay, no problem. Um, we deal with... Uh, it's a, it's a spoonful.com is, is what it is. We're, we're um, uh, reorganized. It's really a spoonful.org. And what it's designed for is it's not really a, an up and running site right now. It's just something right now that there is in, is in the making. Okay? But it's designed to feed people a spoonful of knowledge at a time. And that's what open source is about, is giving people knowledge a spoonful at a time. So once we are able to get that up and running, what we're going to do is provide videos that are free, the same way we showed you there before, and promote it. For, from K through 12 and all the way through college. That's the design. Question. Well, if you're doing that, why don't you grab the coattails of like Khan Academy and put your videos there? Because they already get thousands and millions of hits. That is a great a great question. Um, the gentleman here said, why don't we grab the coattails of Khan Academy and go from there? I've tried that, OK? I'm going to tell you a, a, a couple of things that go with that. One, uh, no, that's, that, that's OK. One of the things is they're kind of fixed in the way that they're doing things. And having people, this is, I'm going to tell you one of the complications of it all, is, and my background is legal, too. Um, one of the things is having too many different contributors runs them into a legal problem of copyright, okay? So what they've done with Khan, as I gave you an example, since he did all the videos by himself, he was able to give it to Microsoft, or Microsoft was able to give him $2 million grant, but he's also able to now promote it through Microsoft as his own content. They don't have to go through a whole bunch of people and go through publishing rights. Yes? There's licensing set up. Creative Commons solves that problem. I'm sorry? Creative Commons solves that problem. Uh, then he doesn't want to sell it. He doesn't want, that's correct. He doesn't want to sell it. And I, I agree with well, you. You're saying Khan Academy is, okay, I, I understand. Right, they don't want to, they don't want to give that out. Okay, okay? they don't want to give that out. So that's, that's something that we have to create our own. Okay, but then again, 
And, and one of the things I, I do say is, um, you can see, I, I hopefully hope that you see that there's plenty of opportunity and there's, that there's plenty of avenue of excelling in this avenue of education. The thing is, we're just trying to gather a group. Yes? There's a site called Show Me Do that does a lot of the same stuff, just with the programming. Just with the programming language? Okay. I just learned of something. Oh, okay, question, I'm sorry. It's, it's, it's show, a, a site called Show Me Do? Yeah. Okay. Dot com. Yes. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You, you want to? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, yes, I, I apologize. There is a site called sh showmedo.com. Okay, showmedo.com that will um, do something similar to as what we were discussing today. Yeah, and it's more for programming languages and stuff like that. And, it's, and from what the gentleman was saying, it's more for programming languages. But we can do it for everything. It doesn't have to be just for programming, it could be for developers. We can put it all in one big location, and then we can go from there. That's, that's the avenue of approach that we're looking to. And everybody and anybody is willing to contribute. It's a community, okay, that we're creating. Okay, yes, it's in an inception stages. It's not about making money or anything of that nature. It's nonprofit, and it's just to excel and help us move forward. Any other questions? No, okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm not going to... Wow, okay. So we kept that uh, smaller. And if I have more... Actually, hold on one second. Uh, let me see. Hold on. I'll... Let me talk about uh, let's see. Okay. Now like I said it doesn't work. But anyway. Not to keep you sorry for the uh, technical difficulties that I'm having, because my internet just won't go. And this way I would show you different sites. But one of the things that we also want to promote is to show you that um, there's so many different jobs that are available for Linux. And I use Linux as a term, but you don't hear people here today in, in this conference here using the word Unix as much. But um, it's something that's available for kids uh, K through 12, and that you can teach them in K through 12. So if there's anyone that's interested in trying to promote that, um, just see me outside in the front and we can make that happen. Thank you very much for, for the time. Okay, so. so yeah. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. 
the most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits with the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisk. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. 
Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.